Go blank. Fill in the blank. The Ecology Club has won round two. We are no longer the tigers because the name shows shocking disrespect for an endangered creature. I know, I'm shocked. The Ecology Club made great posters. They laid out headlines from the sports page. Tigers ripped apart, tigers slaughtered, tigers killed. Side by side with color photos of bangled tigers with their skins peeled off. Effective. The Ecology Club has some good PR people. The football team would have protested, but the sad truth is that they've lost every game this season. They are happy not to be called the Tigers. Other teams called them the Pussycats, not Manly. More than half of the school signed a petition, and the tree huggers got letters of support from a bunch of outside groups and three Hollywood actors. They heard us into an assembly that is supposed to be a democratic forum <coughs> to come up with a new school mascot. Who are we? We can't be the Buccaneers because pirates supported violence and discrimination against women. The kid who suggests the shoemakers in, in honor of the old moccasin factory is laughed out of the auditorium. Warriors insults Native Americans. I think overbearing Eurocentric patriarchs would be perfect, but I don't suggest it. Student Council is holding an election before winter break. Our choice is A, the bees, useful to agriculture, painful to crops. B, icebergs, in honor of our festive winter weather. C, hilltoppers, guaranteed to frighten opponents. D, wombats, no one knows that they're endangered. Closet space. My parents commanded me to stay after school every day for extra help from the teachers. I agreed to stay after school. I hang out in my refurbished closet. It is shaping up nicely. The first thing to go is the mirror. It is screwed into the wall, so I cover it with a poster of Maya Angelou that the librarian gave me. She said Miss Angelou is one of the greatest American writers. The poster was coming down because the school board banned one of her books. She must be a great writer if the school board is afraid of her. Maya Angelou's picture watches me while I sweep them off the floor, while I scrub the shelves, while I chase spiders out of the corners. I do a little bit of work every day. It's like building a fort. I figure Maya would like it if I read in here, so I bring a few books from home. Mostly I watch the scary movies playing on the inside of my eyelids. It is getting harder to talk. My throat is always sore, my lips raw. When I wake up in the morning, my jaws are clenched so tight I have a headache. Sometimes my mouth relaxes around Heather if we're alone. Every time I try to talk to my parents or a teacher, I sputter or freeze. What is wrong, wrong with me? It's like I have some kind of spastic laryngitis. I know my head isn't screwed on straight. I want to leave, transfer, warp myself to another galaxy. I want to confess everything, hand over the guilt and mistake and anger to someone else. There is a beast in my gut. I can hear it scraping away at the inside of my ribs. Even if I dump the memory, it will stay with me, staining me. My closet is a good thing, a quiet place that helps me hold these thoughts inside my head where no one can hear them. All together now. My Spanish teacher breaks the no English rule to tell us that we had better stop pretending we don't understand homework assignments or we're all going to get detention. Then she repeats that wh what she just said in Spanish, though it seems as if she tosses in a few extra phrases. I don't know why she hasn't figured, out, figured it out yet. If she just taught us all the swear words the first day, we would have done whatever she wanted the rest of the year. Detention does not sound appealing. I do my homework, choose five verbs and conjugate them. To translate, try to spear, I tragicate, to flunk, fracasar, yo, yo am almost fracasaring, to hide, esconder, to escape, escapar, to forget, o olividar, I told you, I'm sorry, job day, just in case we forget that, we are here to get a good foundation so we can go to college, live up to our potential, get a good job, live happily ever after, go to Disney World, we have a job day. Like all things high school, it starts with a test, a test of my desires and my dreams. Do I A, prefer to spend time with a large group of people? B, prefer to spend time with a small group of close friends? C, prefer to spend time with family? Or D, prefer to spend time alone? Am I A, a helper? B, a doer? C, a planner? D, a dreamer? If I were tied to a railroad track and the 315 train to Rochester was ready to cut a path across my middle, would I A, scream for help, B, ask my little mice friends to chew through the ropes? B, remember that my favorite jeans were in the dryer and hopelessly wrinkled, or D, close my eyes and pretend nothing was wrong. 200 questions later, I get my results. I should consider a career in A, forestry, B, firefighting, C, communications, D, mortuary science. Heather's results are clearer. She should be a nurse. It makes her jump up and down. Heather, this is
are the best. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'll be a candy striper at the hospital this summer. Why don't you do it with me? I'll study really hard at biology and go to the SU and get my RN. What a great plan. How could she know this? I don't know what I'm doing in the next five minutes and she has the next 10 years figured out. I'll worry about making it out of ninth grade alive. Then I'll think about a career path. First Amendment. Mr. Neck storms into class, a bull chasing 33 red flags. We slide into our seats. I think for sure he's going to explode, which he does, but in an unpredictable, faintly educational way. Immigration, he writes it on the board. I'm pretty sure he spelled it right. Mr. Neck. My family's been in this country for over 200 years. We built this place, fought in every war from the first one to the last one, paid taxes and voted. A cartoon thought bubble forms over the heads of everyone in the class. Will this be on the test? Mr. Neck, so tell me why my son can't get a job. A few hands creep skyward. Mr. Neck ignores them. It is a pretend question, one he asks so he could give the answer. I relax. This is like when my father complains about his boss. The best thing to do is stay awake and blink sympathetically. His son wanted to be a firefighter but didn't get the job. Mr. Neck is convinced that this is some kind of reverse discrimination. He says we should sh close our borders so that real Americans can get jobs they deserve. The job test said that I would be a good firefighter. I wonder if I could take a job away from Mr. Neck's son. I tune out and focus on my doodle, a pine tree. I've been trying to carve a linoleum block in art class. The problem with the block is that there is no way to correct mistakes. Every mistake I make is frozen in the picture, so I have to think ahead. Mr. Neck writes on the board again, debate. America should have closed her borders in 1900. That strikes a nerve, several nerves. I can see kids counting backwards on their fingers trying to figure out when their grandparents or great-grandparents were born when they came to America. If they would have made the neck cut, when they figure out they would have been stuck in a country that hated them or a place with no schools or a place with no future, their hands shoot up. They beg to differ with Mr. Neck's learned opinion. I don't know where my family came from, someplace cold, where they eat beans on Thursdays and hang their wash on the line on Monday. I don't know how long we've been in America. We've been in this school district since I was in first grade. That must count for something. I start an apple tree. The arguments jump back and forth across the room. A few suck-ups quickly figure out which side Mr. Neck is squatting on, so they fight to throw out the foreigners. Anyone whose family immigrated in the last century has a story to tell about how hard their relatives have worked, the contributions they make to the country, the taxes they pay. A member of the archery club tries to say that we are all foreigners and we should give our country back to the Native Americans, but she's buried under disagreement. Mr. Neck enjoys the noise until one kid challenges him directly. Brave kid, maybe your son didn't get that job because he's not good enough, or he's lazy, or the other guy was better than him, no matter what his skin color. I think the white people who have been here for 200 years are the ones pulling down the country. They don't know how to work. They've had it too easy. The pro-immigration forces erupt in applause and hooting. Mr. Neck, you watch your mouth, mister. You are talking about my son. I don't want to hear any more from you. That's enough debate. Get out your book. Mr. Neck is back in control. Showtime is over. I try to draw a branch coming out of a tree trunk for the 315th time. It looks so flat. A cheap, cruddy drawing. I have no idea how to make it come alive. I am so focused I don't notice at first that David Petrakis, my lab partner, has stood up. The class stops talking. I put down my pencil. Mr. Neck, Mr. Petrakis, take your seat. David Petrakis is never, ever in trouble. He is the kid who wins perfect attendance records, who helps the staff chase down bugs on, in computer files of report cards. I chew a hangnail on my pinky. What is he thinking? Has he flipped, finally cracked under the pressure of being smarter than everyone? David, if the class is debating, then each student has the right to say what's on his mind. Mr. Neck, I decide who talks in here. David, you can't open a debate. You can't close it, or you opened a debate. You can't close it just because it's not going your way. Mr. Neck, watch me. Take your seat, Mr. Petrakis. David, the Constitution does not recognize different classes of citizenship based on time spent living in the country. I am a citizen with the same rights as your son or you. As a citizen and as a student, I am protesting the tone of this lesson as racist, intolerant, and xenophobic. Mr. Neck, sit your butt in that chair, Petrakis, and watch your mouth. I try to get a debate going in here, and you people turn it into a race thing. Sit down, or you're going to the principal. David stares up at Mr. Neck, looks at the flag for a minute, then he picks up his books and walks out of the room. He says a million things without saying a word. I make a note to study David Petrakis. I have never heard a more eloquent silence. Giving thanks. Giving th thanks. 
The pilgrims gave thanks at Thanksgiving because the Native Americans saved their sorry butts from starving. I give thanks at Thanksgiving because my mother finally goes to work and my father orders pizza. My normally har harried, rushed mother always turns into a strung out retail junkie just before Turkey Day. It's because of Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, the start of the Christmas shopping season. If she doesn't sell a billion shirts and 12 million belts on Black Friday, the world will end. She lives on cigarettes and black coffee, swearing like a rap star, and calculating spreadsheets in her head. The goals she sets for her store are totally unrealistic, and she knows it. She can't help herself. It's like watching someone caught in an electric fence, twitching and squirming and very stuck. Every year, just when she's stressed to the snapping point, she cooks Thanksgiving dinner. We beg her not to. We plead with her. Send anonymous notes. She doesn't listen. I go to bed the night before Thanksgiving at 10 p.m. She's pounding on her laptop in the dining room at the dining room table. When I come downstairs Thanksgiving morning, she's still there. I don't think she slept. She looks up at me in, in my robe and bunny slippers. Oh, damn, she says, the turkey. I peel potatoes while she gives the frozen turkey a hot bath. The windows fog up, separating us from the outside. I want to suggest that we have something else for dinner, spaghetti maybe, or sandwiches, but I know she won't, wouldn't take it the right way. She hacks at the guts of the turkey with an ice pick to get out the bag of body parts. I'm impressed. Last year, she cooked the bird with the bag inside. Cooking Thanksgiving dinner means something to her. It's like a holy obligation, part of, part of what makes her a wife and mother. My family doesn't talk much. We have nothing in common, but if my mother cooks a proper Thanksgiving dinner, it says we'll be a family one more year. Kodak logic. Only in film commercials does stuff like that work. I finish the potatoes. She sends me to the TV to watch the parade. Dad stumbles downstairs. How is she, he asks, before he goes in the kitchen. It's Thanksgiving, I say. Dad puts on his coat. Donuts, he asks. I nod. The phone rings. Mom answers. It's, sto it's the store. Emergency number one. I go to into the kitchen for a soda. She pours me orange juice, which I, don't, which I can't drink because it burns my scabby lips. The turkey floats in the sink, a 10-pound turkey iceberg, a turkey bird. I feel very much like Titanic. Mom hangs up and chases me out with the instructions to take a shower and clean my room. I soak in the bathtub. I fill my lungs with air and float to the top of the water, and then blow out all of my breath and sink to the bottom. I put my head underwater and listen to my heartbeat. The phone rings again, emergency number two. By the time I'm dressed, the parades are over and Dad is watching football. Confectioner Sugar dusts the stubble on his face. I don't like it when he bums around the house on holidays. I like my dad clean-shaven and wearing a suit. He motions for me to get out of the way so he can see the screen. Mom is on the phone. Emergency number three. The long curly cord snakes around her thin, her thin body like a rope tying her to the stake. Two drumstick tips poke out of an enormous pot of boiling water. She is boiling the frozen tur turkey. It's too big for the microwave, she explains. It will be thawed soon. She puts a finger in her free ear to concentrate on what, she, what the phone is telling her. I take a plain donut from the bag and go back to my room. Three magazines later, my parents are arguing. Not a rip roar, a simmering argument, a few bubbles splashing on the stove. I want another donut, but I don't feel like wading through the fight to get it. They retreat to their corner when the phone rings again, and here's my chance. Mom has the phone to her ear when I walk in the kitchen, but she isn't listening to it. She rubs the steam from the window and stares into the backyard. I join her at the sink. Dad strides across the backyard wearing an oven mitt and carrying the steamed, steaming turkey by one leg. He said it would take hours to thaw, mutters Mom. A tiny voice squeaks from the receiver. No, not you, Ted. She tells, she tells the phone. Dad lays the turkey on the chopping block and picks up his hatchet. Whack! The hatchet sticks in the frozen, frozen turkey flesh. He saws back and forth. Whack! A slice of frozen turkey slides to the ground. He picks it up and waves it at the window. Mom turns her back to him and tells Ted she's on her way. After mom leaves for the store, dad takes over the dinner. It's the principle of the thing. If he gripes about the way she handled Thanksgiving, then he has to prove he can do a better job. He brings in the butchered dirty meat and washes it in the sink with detergent and hot water. He rinses off his hatchet. Dad, just like the old days, right, Melly? While a fellow goes out into the woods and brings home dinner, this isn't so difficult. Cooking just requires some organization and the ability to read. Now get me the bread. I'm going to make the real stuffing the way my mother used to. You don't need the help. Why don't you go do your homework? Maybe some extra credit work to pull those grades up. I'll call you when dinner is ready. I think about studying, but it's a holiday, so I park myself on the living room couch and watch an old movie instead. I smell smoke twice, wince when the glass shatters on the floor, and listen in the other phone to its conversation with the turkey hotline lady. She says turkey soup is the best part of Thanksgiving anyway. 
He calls me into the kitchen an hour later with the fake enthusiasm of, of a father who has screwed up big time. Bones are heaped on the cutting board. A pot of glue boils on the stove. Bits of gray, green, and yellow roll in the burping white paste. Dad, it's supposed to be soup. Me. Dad, it tasted a bit watery, so I kept adding thickener. I put in some corn and peas. Me. Dad, pulling a wallet from his back pocket. Call for pizza. I'll get rid of this. I order double cheese, double mushroom. Dad bur buries the soup in the backyard next to our dead beagle, Ariel.